Hi, this is Michael Cortese, Noble Spirit in uh, Pittsfield, New Hampshire. And I'm Charles Epting of H.R. Harmer in New York City. And this is Conversations with Philatelists. Michael, you gave me a call uh, a couple of weeks ago with the idea for this. Can you talk a little bit about uh, you know, why it is we're here, what it is we're doing exactly? Absolutely. So we're here to talk to stamp collectors, dealers, authors, exhibitors, just to hear their stories. I think that's what really grabbed me when I spoke to you about this the first time is that it's about bringing the humanity to stamp collecting. Yes, everyone, um, you know, some people get into the details of plating a stamp or the cancellation or the route that it took, which is great and fascinating. But I think it's just as important to focus on the people behind the stamps and the, you know, how their journeys, how they got to where they are. How did they become a dealer? How did they start exhibiting? What was the first stamp show they went to? I think that's what's really fun, uh, a fun opportunity for us is to really, um, again, get to the stories behind the people who were uh, so prominent in, in the philatelic world. Exactly, yeah. What are their motives? Um, why do they collect the things they do? And, and what drives them to continue to be a positive force in the hobby? People who are just people that others may know and people that they, that they don't that they should know. I think it's so true because you go to a stamp show and there's people I think I know. I've bought stuff from them for years. And you know, every once in a while you sit down and forget about the stamps and just start talking to them um, you know, as another person and, and hearing where they came from and their life experiences, I think is um, you know, one of the great benefits of going to a stamp show and something I've certainly missed these last couple of months as we're all locked away. Absolutely, yeah. Um, certainly get to know the people behind the photos that they put on their websites to sell you stamps. I know my photo on our website is probably seven years old. I look nothing like the photo. Um, you know, it's just get to know these people now. Maybe their motives have changed from when they first started dealing and, and or collecting or, or studying a specific topic. And, and where do they want to be in 10 years? Where do they want to be in regards to the hobby? Where do they think the hobby is going to be? And just, um, get a better understanding of exactly what you said, the people behind the stamps. When I think that when it comes to um, the first person we're going to be talking to, there's no one more fitting than Alex Hyman, because uh, I know at least personally for myself, and I think for you as well, Alex is a big part of the reason why we are um, where we are today. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. He's, he's why I'm here doing this with you. He's the reason I know you. He's the reason that I even went to my first stamp show, the reason I'm an APS member. Uh, he, he got me involved in stamps in a way that I would have never been without his involvement in stamps. And for those, I'm sure uh, many of you guys know who Alex Hyman is, but for those of you who don't, Alex is a young man, very involved with the American Philatelic Society. He lives in St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, he founded the Young Philatelic Leaders Fellowship, which we'll talk to him more about, but that was a program that both Michael and myself uh, were involved in and, and again, really helped get us to where we are today. And I, I think it's so exciting to have Alex be our inaugural guest. Absolutely. So without further ado, um, on the phone. why don't, yeah, on the screen. why don't we just pop him in here? There he is. Hey. Hello, guys. Hey, how's, how's it going, Alex? That's going well. Going well. I'm uh, excited to participate and help uh, with this new uh, and exciting venture. Sweet. Yeah. Thank you. So to begin, Alex, I, I, I think um, uh, maybe the elephant in the room here is that Michael and myself um, both owe a lot of our careers to you um, with your founding of the YPLF, the Young Philatelic Leaders Fellowship at the APS. So I, 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 I would love to um, start by talking about that because I was a fellow in um, 2014 and 15, I believe. And Michael, you were a fellow. Uh, 2012 and 2013, I think. Or 2013, 2014, maybe. Can you talk a little bit about how you founded this fellowship and, and how it's, it's been um, close to a, or has it been a decade since you founded it now? Yeah, I mean, it's actually that, you know, this, this August was going to be, uh, was going to be the celebration of the graduation of the 10th class, the 10th, you know, sort of the, the, the 10th class. So, yeah, I mean, the idea basically began in 2007. So I'm, I'm 34 years old now. I've been collecting stamps since I was seven and never stopped. Uh, so I didn't stop for school. I kept going. Um, so that was in 1993. And basically in the Detroit area, which funny enough is actually where I'm speaking to you from, um, I would, there were a lot of very active stamp clubs as there still are and a whole bunch of shows. So on any given 
four week period of time, I was able to go to at least a stamp club meeting and maybe one or two stamp shows on a given weekend. And um, most of my friends when I was seven to 12 years old were, uh, you know, if I'd say I had six good friends, I had, when I was 10, I had three of them were 10 years old, 10 year old peers, and then three were 75 year olds. So I had a very mixed generational interaction, but in the stamp side of my life, it, it, of course it skewed much, much older. Um, so that was um, a big part of my early stamp life was really that I was trying to match up as a kid to these much older adults. When I was in college, um, I and got, was you know interacting, you know, living you know, living in Washington D.C. I was working for the Smithsonian um, uh, for the National Postal Museum and started to interact with more people outside of the Metro Detroit orbit or even just out of the the stamp traditional stamp collecting orbit, and it got me thinking about how. I really want, pardon me, yeah, I have my daughter who just walked in here, uh, Corinne, oh, sorry. I'm on a, I'm on an interview. Do you want, want to, just trying to plug this back in. okay, plug it in, please. <laughs> plug it in. Uh, you guys will get to this stage one day too. Um, can you can come say hello. These are my friends, Michael and Charles. Oh, you can see them. Hi. Oh, oh, they can't see you. Hi, Corinne. Hey. Corinne, Corinne, what, 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 what is, what's the thing that uh, that Dada likes to to collect? Uh, Stamps. That's right. <laughs> oh, here, take this, take this to mom. Okay. Why don't we interview what her I instead of you, Alex? Next time, next time, she'll, she'll, she'll we'll get her real prep. We'll do, we'll do good prep. Okay, shut the door, please. All right. Um, so uh, when I got to college and was and was just basically interacting with more people across in my social life that were, of course, my age, it dawned on me. And it really took me until I was probably 19 or 20 before I realized, you know, I don't really have any other stamp friends that are my age. And in probably the mo in, I was I was very involved in stamp dealing at that point as a part-time job and was doing all sorts of things. Probably the next person my age or in my age group was about 10 years older than me. So maybe I was 20 and they were 30. And I basically said, this can't be that it's just me and this other person and maybe a few other people under 50 years old, it just isn't possible. And what I, the intuition I had, which proved to be correct, thank, thankfully, was there are other people like me. What I mean by that is other people that are young, interested in, in stamps, philately, postal history. And I, by the way, I'm going to use that all the time. And I, and I do it and drive some people crazy. Why well, don't just say stamp collecting or just say philately or just say postal history. They all mean different things to different people. And, and it's part of sort of an attempt to be inclusive because different people identify themselves as I'm a stamp collector, I'm a philatelist, I, I'm a postal historian, I, whatever. I want in my remarks to comment that I'm speaking with the biggest, broadest tent, that anyone that's interested in artifacts related to the postal operations of the world, whether it be the stamps, the letters, the envelopes, whether it's collecting them just to be complete, whether it's collecting them to study them, whether it's other interests, scientific, whatever it may be, uh, you're all, everyone is included in, in the tent that I, I think your podcast is gonna be about and also about kind of what we're, what we're all about. So I said, if we could create a way for other young people that are out there in the ether, but are by themselves, that all their stamp friends at the stamp club meeting are all 70 years old, or they have never met someone their age that collects stamps, if we can create a way for getting those individuals to meet each other, and I had met, and in my speech that I gave at an APS Tiffany talk, uh, when I announced this idea to launch this 12 years ago, I gave an example of how I met a young woman and a young man about my age at a stamp show, by actually just by chance, and was talking to the two of them and how the young woman actually had gotten the young man, her boyfriend, interested in stamp collecting, how that pure interaction, her interest in it as a 17, 18 year old, had gotten him interested because it was another person the same age. And basically that kind of spun me to think, well, what about if people that are already interested in philately stamp collecting, so they're already interested, they already have the gene activated, they already have the bug, whatever you want to say, what if they meet each other? What will happen to their, their sort of interest as it is now if they can have not just peers to introduce them, but to sort of level their interest up? And that really is the underpinning of where the YPLF comes from, was the idea of let's try to get other, lots of young collectors together so they can basically build excitement and build a community together. And that's very fortunate. It's happened over the last 10, 11 years while this program has been going. And 
let's facilitate and or let's remove all the barriers that are traditionally in the way of most young people uh, getting involved in national, international stamp collecting or philately, which of course is cost and introductions. So that's the nature of a, of a annual, of a year long program of paying for them to be able to come to the national shows of the, of the tour at the ACAS headquarters, the National Postal Museum and, and doing it always together with the other fellows of their class. So it's remove barriers, make introductions and do it all together with other young philatelist collectors in, you know, in your peer group all of it reinforcing ways to connect young people out from the place where they are and they don't know anyone else to a much bigger platform. And, and it's, you know, accelerating Michael into what he's doing in his family business in the stamp world. It's, uh, it's Charles, it's introducing you to people quite literally, uh, you know, maybe a good episode, a good topic for another episode is sort of what got you with HR Harmer. But in some respects, the biggest problem with the stamp world is a lack of imagination. And I mean that, that's true across the stamp world, but basically older adults are scared of young people and young people are scared of older adults. And as a result, like the older adults know they need to get young people interested and bemoan when they can't get them interested and then sort of just whimper and don't do anything about it. And young people that want to learn and want to get more engaged don't know how because they're it's not clear to a 15 year old or a 20 year old, how do they make the right introduction? How do they make the right impression? So it's sort of bridging this gap and just helping everyone sort of meet in the middle. And it's been this, it's been, a, it's been a great success, far exceeding my best expectations of what was, what would happen in a very short period of time in terms of the numbers that would enter flatly professionally, um, you know, flat, you know, fellows being at each other's weddings and it just things, fellows meeting each other, uh, Ryan and Jessica are about to get married this weekend and they met uh, oh, wow. kind of crazily through me, through the fellowship. I mean, they're both, graduates of the program in different years and they met at a show as alums and so these are all things I could never have anticipated 10 11 years ago um, but it's happened so a long answer but I wanted it, the underpinning is so important and, and I rarely have talked about that piece of it that's great Absolutely. And, and when you talk about uh breaking down those barriers and bridging those gaps I, I think um you know, as a, an alum of the program, it is great. I scroll through Facebook or my Instagram feed and it's people all across the country because there are limited numbers of uh, young people, admittedly. And it's tough, Michael, living up in uh, New England and um, people in Texas, people in the Midwest. I, I think that um, your way of bringing us all together uh, really did create some, some lasting bonds. So personally, and I'm sure I speak for Michael as well, we'd like to thank you for, uh, for the program. Yeah, yep. oh, of course. It, it's one one of the thing that just uh, just made, made me think of something. Philately stamp collecting and people. I, I think it's one of those funny things where someone that doesn't know the players and hasn't met us or met other, you know, the editor of the Scott Catalog or Scott Treppel of Siegel or whoever, just all the people that are out there, have this impression that the stamp world is that the machinery of the stamp world is thousands of people making all of this work. And actually, as we know. It's not. It's a couple dozen people that are basically kind of underpinning the machinery of so much of the major institutions, organizations, publications. And as a result, the incredible thing that I didn't appreciate at the time, and is certainly becoming more and more true, is you don't really need to go find a thousand more young people that get seriously engaged, whether it be as volunteers in the hobby or uh, as professionals. You really only need to go find 50 or 100. And you don't have to find them all at once. You can find them across a 10 or 20 year period of time because it's, there isn't that much attrition. It's, it's about kind of helping grow new things, create new positions, new opportunities. So that's what's really cool about the two of you getting together and doing this is that the two of you are, have in your own orbits, full-time and flatly are making an impact on customers, on new people, and you're making first impressions on new collectors, young and old, all the time. But even getting together and trying to create something new, even if it's just a, a test or if this podcast lasts five episodes or 500 uh, and what you do from it and people that hear it and ideas they get, it's just a few people, just the two of you. And like, that's what I'm so excited about is that Philately is actually a place that you can make great impact as a single person or with a very small group and it can reverberate out and impact thousands of other people, whether it be through the APS or shows, whatever it may be. So Anyway, that's just a you two getting together. It kind of made me think, yeah, yeah, that's another point. Hmm. Yeah, uh, that's definitely true in all aspects. I, I you know, I was always kind of <clears throat> involved 
in philately before I, I met you, but I, I wasn't really like involved in it. It was um, definitely two completely different worlds that I were, that I was unaware of that you were, um, yeah, definitely completely, completely right about that. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's one of those things, if anyone's listening, certainly, you know, reach out to us. That's one of those, uh, I would say that the biggest, if I could wish for one thing, it's that more young people, and I, when I say young, I mean, whatever age you feel you're young. Uh, so, but, you know, I would say people that are in their, you know, teens, 20s, 30s, 40s, and even 50s, uh, that just don't know a lot of other people in their age group, in their, in their peer group, reach out, reach out to us, uh, that there's a lot of people that you just don't know. And th the connecting is so easy in our hobby. And it's such a, I've found to be such a welcoming and warm and engaging hobby. Once you kind of break through sometimes the small sheet of ice that can be right on the surface, um, which that's necessary sometimes. Are you getting just as many applicants um, when you first started it? I mean, did, did you go to the APS to pitch this or how did you make it become a, become a thing and has it? I was, so I had, um, so I started holding tables at, at stamp shows as a stamp dealer when I was in high school here in the Detroit, Michigan area. And then in 2001, when I was 15, I held my first booth at a APS show, which was in Chicago at the main national, at the, the national show for that year. And um, because of that, I kept holding booths at each successive uh, national show. And I think that got me on the radar of the APS board and they, asked me to speak at uh, a Tiffany dinner, which now is, is, is shifted and changed a little bit. Also, somewhat of my responsibility in my role I have with the APS as a, as a volunteer in charge of the campaign for Flatley. But at the time, at the winter show and the summer show, there would be a, 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 an evening, like a fundraising dinner, a small fundraising dinner, and they would invite someone to speak. And they basically said, Alex, talk about your interaction in the hobby as a young person. Talk about whatever you want. And then it was that invitation in the fall of 2007 for January of 2008 in Charlotte, North Carolina, that I basically was like, well, I've got this platform for 20 minutes. I might as well just put out the craziest idea that I have. And, it, and in that talk, I basically laid out, here's, here's the idea for the fellowship. I, I gave it its name then. I mean, I, a lot of the details ended up actually playing out exactly as I laid it out there. The conversation with the APS, my challenge in that speech was, let's go do this. I'll, you know, I'll help, I'll help raise money, I'll help whatever. And uh, we, I had a conversation with the executive director and the education director the next day at the show. And I think that was in January. I was, I think I was at the ABS headquarters a few months later, working out more details. And then we pitched it to the APS board in August of 08. So about six, seven, seven months after the speech. They approved it, and then we spent the next year, August of 08 to August of 09, recruiting the first class. And each year has had, it's varied a, a great deal. I would say each year has had between two to seven applicants, something like that. So, you know, two to four applicants. It, in the end, it's one of those things where we, you know, Charles was in a class of two, Michael, you were in a class of three, four? I think so. There may have been, when I went to Milwaukee, there may have been, been alums that, that went also. Yes, 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 for sure. Um, which has also been a great part of each year that this has grown is more and more alums are in the pool to yeah. be able to come and, and enjoy and, and meet the new fellows. So um, it's one of those things where a single person can make a big difference. And we're always looking for more applicants, always looking to sort of beat the bushes and find people that are, again, that are otherwise isolated, you know, in Southern California, in Texas, in Michigan, wherever they may be. And a lot of it's about getting the word out to the adult community. In the last 10 years, the program's become more prominent. So that's, this has become easy, somewhat easier. But letting the adult community know, hey, if you see a young person who's really excited and really interested, help us. Like make introduction, let them know this exists, give them information. So that's been, that's been a big part of it. And so we had Gretchen Moody, education director, for the first portion of starting the fellowship. And, um, and now we have uh, the next executive, the next director of education uh, in Kathy Brackbill, uh, who's taking it on from there. And so it's all staff led, all staff run. Uh, the curriculum, it's all, all done as part of a, one of the main programs of the APS, which is great because it started off as a very volunteer led, pushing the sled up the, the, the snowy hill as it were, but it's, it's become a much more mainstream thing now. Um, I'm gonna be, I, as we sit here talking, I had never uh, been on a Zoom call before the last couple of months and now I feel like they've become a very ubiquitous part of life. 
Um, and, and obviously, Michael and I have a certain perspective uh, from the dealer side of things, from the selling side of things, how the virus has impacted um, uh, the hobby over these last couple of months. In your role as, because you wear many hats, both with the APS and with the hobby in general, um, in your role as a uh, recruiter, though, as, as um, sort of a, a um, you know, sounding the trumpet for the hobby, how have you found things to be different, better, worse, um, over the last couple of months, trying to get people uh, maybe excited or, or involved in the organized side of things? Yeah, so, I mean, I, I'm by nature a very optimistic person because uh, I've got young children and having kids is a, is a statement of optimism if there ever was once, and I bet I've been this way my whole life. Um, I think in, more than anything, the pandemic, we're, we're kind of in an early, unfortunately, we're probably in an early phase. And what I mean by that is that I don't think this thing is, I don't think we're like halfway through it. I don't think it's terrible to say this and depresses people to think about it, but we're four or five months in, I think we got a long way to go. So this phase, which is the most people kind of have settled into it, um, one advantage of the of philately is it still has an underpin, a huge base that is uh, retirees on fixed incomes or, you know, kind of have more time. Well, now they have even more time to focus on philately because if they also played cards with their friends, well, that's not happening. And so, so if they spent a third of their time on philately, a third of their time on outdoor activities and a third of their time on socializing or traveling, well, that socializing traveling just disappeared. And now they're, even if they redistributed equally, their philately time just increased to 50%. So I think that has been, a, that's why I think we're seeing a lot, which is in the best way that a lot of the, the digital offerings of a lot of different organizations worldwide are, are improving phenomenally. I think what you said, Charles, is true of the vast majority of philatelists uh, worldwide that they had never been on a Zoom call or never had never engaged in a video conference before or never participated in an online webinar, or whatever it may be. And that's a good thing. It's a good thing we've pushed. I think a lot of people have been pushed to do new things in this era. I think it's given more people more time. And if you were already interested in philately, that extra time means you can double down on so many more things that, of your interest. You can explore things you may never have the time for. Or you've got literally more time at home in quarantine, depending on where you are in the world, just more time. The other side of it is that there's been an, a, a plethora of articles and focus, especially in the early part of the, of the pandemic in the March, April time when a lot, when there was a lot more shutdown, though I think that's coming, we're gonna have that again soon, states around the country in the United States. Um, is that people that might have had a stamp interest or have had a hobby interest but didn't have a hobby chosen. This is true, I think, going to be true across lots of different hobby categories that 10, 20 years from now, one of the ways that we're going to hear people got back into or into philately as coin collecting and everything else is going to be, I actually picked it back up during that pandemic of 2020. Like it's going to be part of the narrative of how people got interested is going to be, I was on eBay. And, and, and then eBay, which has already become a great thing and has been for a long time, way before the pandemic in terms of engaging non-collectors in philately, they were looking up something else and they find a philatelic item, what's this? I'm interested in World War II. I never thought about the letters or the envelopes. It's always been a great cross-pollinator. Well, now it's really even more valuable because it's really a perfect receptacle for people that are just have time to waste. And waste is a have time to spare. Right. So that's a really powerful tool. And I think that again, all of the other web assets of the whole philatelic world are now being tested in a good way, which is people are now have spending more time searching, more time looking, are we there to receive them? That's really the question. I think that the pandemic, if it gets worse and we have real health issues or an economic event, that, that a macroeconomic event that causes a big economic downturn for a prolonged period of time, that of course will affect the stamp market potentially. It'll affect the buying habits of the, of, sort of the line collector, the normal co collector that's not spending thousands of dollars on a one item at a time. They're spending a thousand dollars across a whole year maybe. So I think that spending will could, could hurt a lot. But as we know, when we were kids and when we engaged in different ways, you can you can engage in flatly at a very low, low amount of money and still have it be quite fulfilling and really interesting. And the social aspect, if you can start getting engaged in all different ways in that world, whether it be through clubs, the reading journals, study. So I, I'm very bullish. And I think that not that this is going to launch a golden era 
to come, but I think that we are, that this is going to accelerate a lot of the technology adoption throughout the hobby, both in the professional side, auctions, dealers, as well as the volunteer organizations and publications that maybe it's not now, but at some point in the future, could be a year from now, could be right now, could be five years from now, I think we're going to see the moment when the whole internet stamp collecting world, the people that have never left their homes to buy a stamp, start to merge in a good way with the whole world that existed at stamp shows and existed in stamp clubs and societies. And I see, I see a growth pattern for philately going into the future in a way that I think maybe pre-pandemic, when there wasn't as much technology adoption, people didn't see the same way we do now. I agree that a lot of um, a lot of what we're doing, whether it's Zoom, when we hold an auction and we have, um, uh, you know, obviously we've been using live bidding and things like that for a while. I think of the, I think a lot of the technology was inevitable, but people were maybe not so willing to adopt it by choice. And in a way, I think the necessity of, um, you know, online stamp club meetings or online uh, collectors club talks and things like that. I think it's it's really um, uh, you know just sort of fast tracked the inevitable. And and in the best possible way. It's one of these things where you always whenever you talk about the a positive about the the pandemic era, there's always this caveat that everyone has feels they have to make, and it's true. And they should everyone should have it in mind, which is of course people's health and the disruption economically and the and the economic crisis that it's created for millions of people in varying forms, that is all outweighs the positive of some of the good things, but the kind of the, how do we see a glass half full? How do we see like the hope or what could be that is good? What you just said, Charles, is dead on. That there is no way that anything would have brought the, the, the vast majority of stamp clubs in the United States, which are critical infrastructure, the sort of the first line of interaction that many people have lo to their local area, nothing would have brought as many of them online as this era would have, no matter what kind of campaign we would have run or how many people we would have drafted to help us do it. It would have taken, I think it would have taken us a decade to have done what I think one year will do right now as it relates to dragging, polling, pushing people and the organizations that need it most into, to say into the 21st century. Many are in the 21st century, but to have them adopt these technology tools and to gain comfort with them is going to be huge. The Royal Field Talk Society in London has more, more of its members live a, you know, more than 100 miles away from London. So the vast majority of international members like myself, you can't go to a physical meeting. And yes, they did recordings of meetings. They post them later. But what they've done with Zoom, I mean, they're getting more people to, to, be, to be live on a Zoom event for any of their speakers than they've ever had a combination of watching the videos and of that were physically present at the meetings themselves. That's massive. I mean, that's what takes them, what could take them from a 2,500, 3,000 person organization or membership base to 5,000 people simply because of how it's perceived the accessibility of the offering of the society is so much more ready for them. Um, but they don't feel like it's, I'm just watching a recording, you know, every couple of weeks and, I can never go to London, so why would I join this organization? But if you feel like you can be much more present, maybe it'll make a difference. APS, summer seminar, so many other things that, like, summer seminar by many measures should have been a virtual event in a big way many years ago, but hasn't. Why? Because they have this great built-in audience, which made perfect sense. They were willing to spend money. They were willing to come to Belfont. They were willing to have an in-person experience. And that's how we've lived for so long. And Philately is valuing that in-person, the touch. We, we collect buy, sell real things. So interact with each other in real time and real in person matters. Um, I think I, I can't say enough and I'll stop with this very long response, but I think that we haven't even begun to see the best benefits of the technology adoption that we're witnessing throughout the hobby right now. Yeah, I, I, I took some seminar, summer seminar courses myself um, and I hadn't, I hadn't gone in six years. Mm -hmm. I think to, to DC for the last one um, six years ago, but I took three courses myself because yeah, they, you, you're, they were so convenient. They were $10 each, they're at a time and you sign up for the course. And even if you couldn't make it, they, they recorded it and posted it online. And you, if you bought the tickets, you've got access to it. And it's, it, 
is really yeah. helpful because you see people them I couldn't make and then I just watch them later. I predict if just summer seven or I predict in five within five years. I can't remember what the exact number. It, it was a very impressive number that it did this first time. I mean, I think there'll be at 5,000 or more students within a matter of years. It's not a, as long as the offerings remain very, very good, the, the ability to spread the word on that and the low cost, you know, basis, the whole world can come to summer seminar now. That's the best part. It's like, you can be anywhere. Who cares? And to your point, Michael, like, yeah, oh, your time zone problems. Okay, you watch the recordings at your at your leisure and you can you can send questions to the instructor. And I just think it's all powerful, all very powerful. I think what's great too, a lot of people have been um, toying with live streams. A lot of people have done recorded talks. People have been using, uh, I, I've seen at least more action on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. I really think it's great too that these last couple of months, it seems like we've, thrown everything against the wall to see what sticks. Yeah. And then as the pandemic, um, you know, as, as things sort of settle down and we enter this new normal that everyone's talking about, I think, um, I think we'll have such a large sample size to draw from. We can see what worked. Summer seminar brought the APS X amount of new members, but this other program maybe didn't bring as many. I, I think that it, it's nice to have so many control groups from such a short amount of time as well. Things that maybe were hypothetical or theoretical, um, you know, a year or two ago, I, I really feel like um, the the rate at which things are being tried out can only benefit the hobby in the long run. And it's, we were talking about, you know, again, about how just a few people can make a huge difference. Even if we throw all this against the wall, in some respects, the best outcomes, though it's, it's sometimes it's hard, this has been a challenge I've had with the, with the APS Youth Fellowship, is people buying into the fact that if you spend a lot of money and time and effort and you, and you yield just a few people that become super engaged, that that investment, when they have a 50, 60, 70 year time horizon of engagement is infinitely valuable, way more than whatever amount of cost and time resources we're spending now, that all of this throwing against the wall, if we get out of it, and I mean, we, the hobby and professional, the whole big tent hobby, if we get five to 10 more really supercharged young people in their 20s and 30s that didn't have a hobby before or did as the kid and got reengaged, saw someone's Twitter feed, saw an Instagram post, it got them excited again. They found this podcast, they found the website, they found whatever. It, it could be worth the entire effort of an entire organization to go get three of them because the three of them could end up being hugely impactful uh, orchestrators of all sorts of future hobby engagement marketing, uh, outreach, uh, professional roles, uh, volunteer time. So I, I'm, I'm a believer that spending big on long bets, but sort of being satisfied with not being able to see the immediate impact of what the people we bring in. So back to this, like putting all these social media posts out there, who knows? There's a lot, it's hard to measure, hard to measure the time and effort putting into this. And you're, and I, I see a lot of people who will say, oh, the APS had X amount of members in 1980, and they look at it as almost a one-to-one -one replacement. For every member we lose, we need to gain a new member. We need to um, get back to where our membership numbers were 40 years ago. Um, but I think you're exactly right, that it, it's not about the, the absolute numbers. It's not about the, um, you know, I think that one or two engaged youth fellows is so much more powerful and has so much uh, so many more uh, repercussions long term than if you sign up a hundred people who drop out after a year. I would say, yeah, there's it's interesting because I there's a I used to say something that was very unpopular or people rub people the wrong way, and I would say something like, um, "Is it if the, if we if you have the choice of bringing in I think it was like a ten thousand seventy year old or seventy five year old members to the APS or a hundred that are super committed." Like as committed as the typical very committed APS member or a hundred 25 year olds that are made out of college, made in professional life. And they're like, like rearing to go committed. Um, which would you choose? And my comment was always, you absolutely want the 125 and the, 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 the real middle ground here is that you sh we shouldn't have to choose. Let's try to go after both. And so it's not really, it's never, it's not a true or, but if we can go the 125 year olds, 
their time horizon, not, you know, 75 year olds, let's say they've got 20 years of really, you know, at the best, of really good engaged time. Those 20, those 70, those 125 year olds, even if we retain half of them, but they have a 50, 60, 70 year horizon, their impact is uh, exponential, logarithmic. I mean, it has no, you can't measure the impact of, the, of, the, of that cohort and what they could, and the impact they could have on the hobby. So, yeah, no, I, I'm, um, I think we live in a time where up until the pandemic, I would have said, I would have agreed with you entirely that yes, it's not one-to-one. -one, that's not the, how we should look at it. But I actually believe now more than ever that the APS and all the organizations um, that have strong backings currently can absolutely see membership growth in the years to come, especially as they have adopted and been more thoughtful about their technology adoption. There's no reason to me that the APS which at its height had 56, 57,000 members 25, 30 years ago, that there are 30,000 now. I think it is possible to have 40,000, for example, 10 years from now. And that sounds like a crazy number. Who could, we just want to stop the loss, for example. But again, the number of people that we know are out there that are engaging uh, all through the internet, but they're just as committed to the hobby, but they just don't care about going to a stamp show or getting a physical magazine. If we have something to offer them, they will join. And if we make the right pitch, they will, they will come. So I'm again, very optimistic, but I, I think there's a lot, I think we're in, we're entering a golden era. I think that it's not the golden era of the 1930s, Charles, um, but rather um, uh, there is, there's, there's something very exciting to come. And I think it's a combination of look at both of your time horizons, look at mine, look at the amount of opportunity we have over you know, God willing, decades of time to come of engagement of new customers of being out there to be receptacles to people to reach out to if they want to get involved in the hobby. We could each impact, if we each impact one person a year, and, and that becomes as fervent as we are. But for the next 50 years, these are, that's 150 people that each are themselves making that many ripples. You're at a membership growth easily. So that I, I, I you can slice a lot of ways. That's the way I look at it, at least. Have you had much time during the pandemic to work on your own collecting interests? Because huh. I, I know you've been keeping busy with, uh, with, with your non-philatelic work as well. Yeah. Um, Great you, talk, you talk about how this has given people a chance to maybe revisit old projects. Have you yourself uh, benefited from that? Uh, absolutely. Um, so I, I, I've, so I've been involved in the buying and selling side for a long time and, and still am. So that's been a, actually a very busy part. And I've noticed a, a huge activity, especially in that March, April time uh, on, on online uh, in the buy and the selling side on the collecting side. Um, it's a good thing. I've been back in another podcast to talk about it, but I've been in the works for several years on a project uh, for a, a museum level exhibition that would take place in London at the Royal Philatelic Society that was scheduled to take place in 2019 and then they sold the building that it was going to be in so it got pushed to 2021 and it's something i've been working on since 20, 2015 so i'm now five years into this project so now of course because of it is very unlikely that i think that international travel and big public gatherings are going to be safe enough in in a matter of whatever nine months from now so that's been pushed and we're kind of working on new dates for hopefully summer of 2022 or thereabouts so that's a project that um, has been all consuming on my hobby personal time. Um, and I mean, I was, so it's a, it's focused on, my, I have an interest in, in British Southern Africa and uh, in particular the Zulu people in, in South Africa and their interaction with colonialism and the British and a war that was fought in 1879. And so I collect um, postal history and, and stamps and anything postal related to sort of the 1870s, 1880s and sort of the Zululand area um, and all its forms. And, but I also collect, I'm kind of a crazy person that sort of doesn't just collect within philately and stamps and postal history. I collect everything that touches this area from five foot tall, 1879 period Zulu shields, uh, leather cowhide shields to uh, uh, British antique firearms uh, to uh, military medals, uh, uniforms, uh, uh, Zulu cultural objects. I, I, I'm fascinated by the Zulu side of, of the story and they didn't have a written language at the time. So how do you tell their story? When I'm a postal history guy at, 
at heart. So it's how do you how do you figure that out? So uh, I have spent a lot of time on that pursuit, that hobby, um, that portion of my hobby. But it's been stressful because so much unknown. Like I can't travel to these places anymore. I was supposed to go to South Africa for a research trip for this exhibition and South Africa in mid-March and South Africa like cut off US travelers like five days before I went. So it's been a, the pandemic has definitely been a very real part of my hobby um, time um, as it has everyone's, but in particular it has actually canceled trips of mine related to my hobby interest. Have you been to South Africa before? I have. Um, so I've, I've been there, this will be my fourth trip. I've been there three times, each time to Zululand. So uh, my, it's a long story. Again, another good conversation for next time. But my name's Alex, of course, um, and uh, Z for Zulu. So I've been just, when I was a kid and, found, and learned about the Zulu War as a 11-year-old, I'd always seen Zululand in the Scott catalog. I'd always seen like it, as the last country in, the, at a, in a dealer's box. There's so many... There's so many things that, that that Z, U, that sort of end of the alphabet always really struck me and I really loved it, but I didn't know anything about Zululand. And so until my interest in this began about 20, 23 years ago, um, that sort of picked up and I started collecting and learning more. And I went for the first time three years ago and it was amazing. And so Zululand is in what is now sort of Northeast South Africa uh, on the Indian Ocean side. And um, I've been there now three times. Each time I've gone for different reasons. Uh, the most recent time was last year for the 140th anniversary of this war. Uh, I was there as a guest of the British delegation to the Zulu Kings commemoration, current Zulu Kings commemoration of the 140th anniversary of the ending of, or of the war, uh, which was amazing to be there for that that event and in the and sort of with the Zulu royal household and the and all the activities around that. So yeah, it was. I've gotten way beyond just collecting the stamps or the, the postal history. It's turned into a real um, pursuit, a real area of study and passion. Wow. That's uh, most people don't know anything about uh, this. Is something I'm, I don't talk very much about actually. Um, and last year, Matt Healy, Matthew Healy wrote a piece in Lynn's about or maybe it was a, little, a year and a half ago about this collecting area that I collect, not just the philatelic, Part of it but also all these different other areas and it was the first time in 20 years that i've had really been public about this interest and i saw the exhibit uh the single frame at stockholm last year and it was uh it was i i learned more from those uh 16 pages than um a lot of people are able to squeeze into an entire book so i have to commend you on uh, your presentation of the philatelic very, side of things very kind you know it's one thing and another good conversation topic maybe not to interview me but to interview someone else that you know exhibiting and the, the formalities of philately are amazing and age old and have lots of great history and heritage baked into them but they also can be some of the most turn off parts of our hobby to everyone else that's not involved in them so part of my interest uh in this putting together this exhibit which was a, a mounted uh, for those of you listening at an exhibit in this format, it happens at a, at a big stamp show typically, and they're mounted in sort of frames like a museum case, but they're, it's two-dimensional and flat, and you can mount your items on pages, and you can put them up inside of this frame that they put kind of a glass pane down in front so no one can touch the items themselves. But when you walk through and look at them, it is the real artifacts, the real stamps and covers. And my idea was, let's try to mimic a museum exhibition using the white space of the pages the way that a museum panel at the Smithsonian or the British Museum would use it. So it's not just the objects to focus on, but also all that space, all the space for the text, all the space for the explanation, all the space for sort of other imagery to help you understand the context. So that was my, my purpose in that, in that exhibit. And uh, it's funny, actually, my, the way I really wanted to show that and the way this exhibition will be done was I wanted to show lots of three-dimensional objects that wouldn't fit in a two-dimensional frame right next to it, like a shield, like a uniform, like a, like a, a firearm. That, that was, that's what really gets you to look at it and go, wow, like this is how, like this cover wasn't written, you know, in a little sterile room it's somewhere. It was written, you know, on a battlefield, it was written in a tent. It was written in a real place, in a real time with real things happening around it. And I think philately's greatest, most exciting aspect is it's a way to touch and hold history, almost weightlessly in the palm of your hand. That is the magic of philately. And I think it's, how do, we, how do we tell that story? How do we get more people excited about it is, the, is one of the great challenges of my life and, or has been, and certainly continues to be. And each of you in 
in the selling side and the buying side and the advising collector side, it's about keeping those fires burning with that passion and how to keep people connected to all of it. Well, and following up on that, I get my last question, and then I'll, I'll turn it over to Michael. But um, when you talk about the limitations of philately physically, um, in terms of an exhibit frame or geographically in terms of having to get to London or Monaco or even within the States. Um, I'm going to ask you to look into your crystal ball. Okay. And I would love to hear your predictions for where things will be in five, 10 years. Will the digital side of things uh, replace the more tactile, physical, social side of things? Will they complement one another? Will they grow in harmony with one another? If you had to, to picture going to an APS show or StampX in 10 years, post virus, hopefully, <laughs> um, w w where, do you, where do you see the hobby going from here? I know it's, it's probably the most difficult question I could ask you and I'm sorry. Uh, no, but, no, it's, it's a great question. Uh, um, most directly, they will complement each other that's the most direct answer. Um, I think that the physical, the in-person events in all their forms have a big upside, a, a, an aspect that's going to be assisted by technology and the internet and the social connections people will make through technology. And it has a big downside that that's going to get harmed by technology. And, and their key is how, how do these two, inter, these two sides interact with each other to still create a thriving in-person experience? which is my prediction is that it will be thriving. The upside is related to that. There is no doubt that and this has been true. Online dating is probably the best example of this and seems so strange to use that as this sort of paradigm or whatever. But the idea is that people meet online and they want to meet each other. And I'm not saying that stamp collectors meet online because they want to have a romantic relationship with each other necessarily. But for the most part, it is a shared passion. So there is an interest to meet the, the real people behind um, especially sh hobbies, interaction. This is true throughout all hobbies that, and, and chat boards going back to the 1990s and early internet days that meeting in person at the Star Trek convention at the stamp, where that mattered. Some of my closest friends, people I met online in the stamp world, people I met online and then met in person. We were arranged to meet at a big stamp show and hey, let's actually meet in person. We've talked by Facebook or whatever it is. So that's a huge upside. So I think that that the continued engagement of technology and the, and the marketing and the engagement with more people that are interested in philately and stamp collecting around the world and having more places for them to meet online and more venues for them to engage is a huge upside for creating more personal connections and, and friendships. And, and we also collect Canal Zone. I collect Canal Zone and we live half a world away from each other or different in different states. Like let's arrange to meet at the this show. Let's arrange, you know, where you know, do you think you'd be willing to travel? So there's so many ways that that, that in person can can happen. That's the big upside. The big downside is, of course, for what underpin stamp shows more than anything financially, is the support of the professional community, stamp dealers and stamp auction houses. And their worlds in the same technology revolution that continues. It's been going on, as you pointed out, and Michael's in an all you know digital world in, in terms of what in terms of their you know their powerhouse business and HR Harmer sort of straddles in a good bad way doesn't you know whatever way and and the Global Philatelic Network straddles digital and in person, but if the dealer community were to completely convert to an all digital world, it'd be great for the market for the hobby because. You'd still be able to buy stamps. You still be able to find stamps. That 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 part's not going away. The problem is, is that having stock that lives in a stamp show environment as well as a online environment is complicated. It's not easy, and as a result, it this is the divide that you have a lot of younger people that younger people that are involved in buying and selling. That if they're on the selling side, they're they're going online, and the key is. How do we create the events and the financial underpinning that keeps the events active and successful and possible so we can then have them be the places where collectors can come meet each other? So that, that's like, it's, it's not exactly a conundrum, but it's sort of like, this is the problem, which is technology, I think, is going to create more connections of people, which is great, and create more reasons why more people are going to want to meet each other because they're shared interests and shared passions within philately. 
The digital revolution, so in summary, the digital revolution is going to create more pressure on dealers and the pandemic is the perfect example of why this is gonna maybe accelerate even more than ever before. Because if you are a show dealer that has no online presence, you're screwed. There's no shows, like you're hosed. If you have an online presence, you are actually benefiting tremendously from the entire customer base having no choice but to go online if they want to buy anything. So how many dealers are going to migrate away from that and just go online completely and then never do a show again? How do we deal with that? How do we have a show that has a shrinking dealer base but a rising collector base? And if there are, but, but at the same time, if there are less dealers coming to shows, I think that's also going to bring the audience down. The more dealers and the more new dealers, the more dealers with new stock, the more people I think will, will attract. So it's a, it's a chicken and egg type problem. But my prediction overall is I think it will actually be very, that the future of Flatly is very, is very positive. And that I think that we're going to have a shrinking number of total number of events, but we're going to have a, an improving or an exciting kind of, um, so let's say there's, I don't know, let's say in the United States, there's a thousand stamp shows a year. I don't know, 800 stamp shows a year. I think there's, there's going to be, you know, 200 stamp shows a year, five years from now, but they're going to be as, a, as single events better than the average of what those 800 ones were in terms of their size, their concentration, their scale. Um, so that's, it's like a shrinking and kind of a, What's the word I'm looking for? Kind of a shrinking and uh, empowering is the word I want to use. That's not right, but a shrinking and kind of a reinforcing positive uh, for some of these events. So um, we'll see. Uh, that's my prediction. I, I think it all depends on who kind of gets into the hobby over the next five to 10 years. I mean, new dealers entering, I mean, Char you know, five years ago, Charles, or six years ago, where were you? Like, you know, no, you know, not, you were nowhere. You know, Michael, you know, evolved with, you know, having a family background, but you know, your real interest in engagement to stay full time is a more, is a last couple of years. So if you guys had gone other directions, well, look at the impacts you're having the businesses you have. So if we get 10, 20, 30 you know, people in their 20s, 30s, 20s, 30s, 40s that get involved professionally, for example, that could just those people alone could change the course of all sorts of in-person events. So that's why it only takes a few people to make my prediction very right or very wrong in either direction. It'll be interesting too to see the the shows that do essentially like like live, um, if they then become standalone shows or if they embrace virtual as well. So you now have all these virtual shows popping up. People can attend them from from all over the globe. But then once this whole it becomes safe to go back outside to go back to the shows um do those shows then also embrace virtual as well and allow people from london to come to a show in california somehow um or do they kind of cut ties with with virtual and uh and act as a standalone show then you kind of you've got the, the best the best outcome is the hybrid guaranteed the best outcome of what comes with this is the it in, in funny way, actually, auctions already are this at shows. Charles has run these. You already have a virtual component at a live event. So it's about now making, in some respects, summer seminar. It, this is the hard part. This is the merging of the two. It's like living in all, all in person world is, is easy, whereas like, you know, level two difficult versus level five, which is super difficult. And doing an all virtual but with no in person component is level two. Putting the two together and having them live is like a level four or like level five. It's much more complicated. The video, the feed, the interaction, how do you merge the interaction of the digital and text or chat and how do you make it work? I don't know yet. We don't, I don't think we have an idea yet, but the ideal is where you have an APS summer show and that's really the venue where it'd be perfect. You may have three to 5,000 people in, ten, in attendance but the best part is you set up every single meeting that takes place throughout the show, all those society meetings where we facilitate the virtual attendance for all of them. So when you have 10 people in the room, you can have 25, 30, or 50 people joining virtually. And if we can merge those two events where actually the true attendance of the show is really 15,000 people, but 10,000 of them were virtual, this includes maybe how we engage dealers through a virtual interaction during the live event. 
versus they're testing these sort of virtual, sh all virtual shows. I'm skeptical of, of, of that environment. I, I, I think it's got a lot of kinks to work out, but I am actually more bullish on an in-person show that is all live that has, I don't know if it, if, if it's a, you have like a virtual buyer, like, you know, you're waiting here and like, you know, you're next in the queue and, or I'm looking for revenue stamps. And like, I take a little device and you're in Singapore, you're wherever and I take the device and I'm your, I'm your buyer. And we go over to a revenue dealer and like, I'm holding like a camera and you can like see what I'm seeing. And I can, I like, I can, you can then talk, like you can speak to that dealer. I don't, anyway, I, I mean, there's lots of ways that could work, but it's a way of bridging the the show dealer with the virtual world. It's a way of bridging, bringing the virtual world to really care about the show. You can charge people for this. So you can have it as a revenue base for the show. Another way to underpin the financial element of how to put on these live events. So we haven't even begun to see the, the real opportunities in, in my view of, of where these are going. But I'm hoping, Michael, to your point, your question, your comment, I, I I'm hoping that we're going to live in a hybrid model where the virtual will, is not going away. These will not be standalone shows. They will be together. They will be done together. Yeah. Like um, show agents almost. But that's just one, one possibility. I mean, the other thing is, you know, um, you can imagine where people all log on and like you go dealer to dealer and you could be on there with a hundred other people in, in a, in a show tour and each dealer gets 10 minutes and they get to like show you their like 10 best things. I, there's so many ways and you like sort of okay then we go to the next person and it's like oh and but they, maybe not 100 people maybe thousands of people would join that to get a, a like a top 10 of every single dealer at at a live show I, I think the audience for that is immense so what's that worth it's worth a lot um, especially with summer seminars proving that we can execute on sort of the short form courses low cost we should just deliver all that at, at stamp show and make and create as many reasons to be in person and as well as draw as much digital audience attention on those days as, as well. And I just think Scott English and the team at the APS, which is running as fast as they can and in a lot of good ways and testing different things. I, I think they're going to figure this out. And I think that that's the direction it's going. And, you know, thank God it's going that way. Cause it, if it, it we were going to, the hobby was going to suffer a, a calamitous, I want to call it end, but we were going to suffer a calamitous fall off that it was going to get to a point where we were going to be so far behind the technology movement of how people communicate, interact, that we would be missing people for how they're trying to look for us on the internet. They would never find philately ever because we would just be so far behind how people find new hobbies or how people find new interests. Just they'd, they'd skip it. Fantastic. Michael, if you have anything else for Alex, I think this has been a, uh, Really excellent chat. I think these last couple of months have given everyone a lot more to think about than we all anticipated. Yeah. Um, you, the, the, the turn of the new year. And I, I love hearing other perspectives. Again, sometimes I feel like I have tunnel vision as an auctioneer or Michael, you as a, an online uh, dealer. I, I think, uh, you know, sometimes I get locked into what does this mean for myself and my company? And I, I love hearing um, uh, outside opinions like yours, Alex. I, I can't thank you guys enough for, yeah, this, I realize you're testing something new and trying to have conversations that aren't just about the details of a philatelic subject, but are diving into parts of the hobby and thinking about new ideas. Great. Thank Yeah. Thank you so much for, for joining us with this time. And um, it was a pleasure having you and talking to you. I haven't spoken to you in a while. Yeah. It's, uh, this was good. Um, well, cool. Hey, yeah. Well, gentlemen, have a good rest of your afternoon and awesome. really thrilled to talk with you and, Onward. Again soon. Yeah. All right. We'll talk See you to later. You. Thanks, Alex. Well, that was great. I thought that was fantastic. I knew Alex would be a great person to kick this off with. Yeah, absolutely. And and a lot of the things he said rung true to the hobby's past and and they're decently accurate predictions for its future. I hope so. I really uh I, I love Alex's optimism and I really hope that uh you know what he's saying is is where we'll be in a decade or two. Yeah. Absolutely. So, so what's next for us? What, uh, what can people expect from us in the future? Um, well, I think for the most part, we'll start off every other episode um, with news. Fantastic. I think we can go over auction realizations, uh, USPS announcements. Uh, you really just, uh, try and keep our finger on the pulse of what's happening in the hobby. 
exactly while interviewing other people and asking their them their thoughts as well so what's next who are we going to be talking to next week so next week we've got gary lowe of the american philatelist fantastic gary was the head of the expert committee for a while great author very knowledgeable postal historian i enjoy his articles very much so um really looking forward to talking to him yeah yeah it should be great i'm looking forward to meeting him i've never spoken with him before but um I think that's what's so great about this format is even though uh, you're up in New, Ham- uh, New England, um, I'm down here in New York, Gary's in Pennsylvania, Alex was in St. Louis, I think technology makes it so easy for us to all, uh, and even if we haven't met or even if we haven't seen each other in a while, um, I think it's great for us to be able to connect like this. Absolutely. Well, um, I'll see you next week then, Charles. Sounds good, Michael. Great talking to you. Great talking to Alex and uh, can't wait to uh, do this again. All right. Bye.